Okay, everyone. Um, I'd like to uh, welcome you to yet another uh, Academy of International Business webinar series uh, done in conjunction with uh, the journals, the Journal of International Business Studies and the Journal of International Business Policy. Uh, the webinar today is going to focus on current and historic conflict in international business activity. Uh, this is a particularly germane topic, uh, it, you know, particularly given um, uh, the rising tensions that we see um, in the world today, but also the 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 issues related with <clears throat> uh, protests, uh, both in uh, related to uh, uh, Black Lives Matter, uh, but a number of other uh, areas, including uh, issues related to um, uh, uh, Hong Kong uh, and other parts of the world. Um, what we'd like to do, though, is, is also note that um, the, the part of the reason that we're having the webinar is um, is to highlight uh, an upcoming special issue uh, in the Journal of International Business Policy um, on managing theorizing and policy making in an age of social and political uncertainty. Uh, the editors of that are, are uh, Chris Hartwell, Jennifer Otto, uh, Paul Valor, uh, and myself. And um, uh, we would never have guessed, I guess, when we were thinking about uh, doing this special issue probably more than a year ago, uh, that we would be so um, prescient in our ability to predict what might be hot topics in the future. Uh, but in, in many ways, this special issue is really uh, almost completely in the wheelhouse of the sorts of issues that we see going on in the world today. Um, and so we decided to uh, uh, not just kind of have the special issue but to kind of highlight it a bit by looking at some other papers which have been recently uh, published in the journals uh, of the AIB um, to kind of highlight the importance of the topic, but, but also to kind of get some coalescence of ideas. Uh, and so uh, we encourage you to think about this if you have papers uh, that you think might fit into the, into the special issue, you can look at the JIBP website and see the call in particular. Uh, the deadline for submission um, is a little bit over a month from now, um, uh, the 1st of September. Uh, but we're looking for a, a whole variety of different types of um, uh, submissions. And those submissions themselves will also be part um, of uh, our own kind of special mini conference, which will be related to this. Whether that'll be uh, physical or virtual would depend depend on the reality that we find ourselves in um, in the next couple of months. Um, so without much further ado, I, I'd like to sort of kind of uh, uh, introduce our panelists, uh, Chen Guang Li from the Ivy Business School, uh, John Louise from the Sussex Business School, and Chang Lu from Rutgers University. Um, as always, there's myself and Klaus Mars, the organizers of these sessions. Um, today, uh, we're going to have two moderators, uh, again, linking back to the special issue um, that we're doing. Um, uh, Paul Valor from the University of Minnesota will so, sort of start the discussion, and Jennifer Otzel from uh, American University will, will pick up on the Q&A. So without much further ado, I'm going to turn over to Paul. Thank you, Tim, and welcome to everyone who's a part of this webinar. Looking forward to it. We have three great papers that are around issues of conflict, everything from dyadic military context to reforms and to terrorism. So we've got it all. And that captures just one part of the broader set of topics that we're interested in as special editors, the upcoming special issues. So again, I want to reiterate what Tim said, which is to look at that special issue call. And uh, for people who are working on papers that look like they fit with the specific topic today or the broader topic in the special issue, please uh, look and, and consider submitting to it. I think this is a great opportunity to not just enter into a debate, uh, which I think is understudied, but to make a real difference in issues as they're happening. As Tim said, um, this has turned out to be a fantastically relevant as well as I think a, a rigorous uh, special issue. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to our authors with this proviso. As we work through the presentations, my colleague Jennifer Etzel is gonna be taking your comments, your questions, 
which you'll pose to her in the chat function of the Zoom that you have, and she'll collect them. And then at the end of the three presentations, Jennifer will, uh, uh, will read out the questions and we'll start the discussion with the authors through that. So that's the way to interact with us through Jennifer on this. Without further ado, let me turn things over to our authors. And, and can I just interrupt for a minute? Sorry, please. it's not the chat function, folks. It's the question and answer function. Pardon me. So use the question and answer function um, directly. Um, so, sorry. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. So let me turn it over to Chengguan with the first paper for our presentation. Chengguan, the floor is yours. All right. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, it's a big pleasure to be presenting our work here on behalf of my uh, co-authors, Ilga Sudet and Asli. Um, our work examines um, the influence of bilateral military conflicts between two countries on the stock market reaction to cross-border acquisition announcements involving two firms, that is the acquirer and the target firm, from those two countries. And we've conducted this research in order to complement um, the valuable research done previously, traditionally using more, let's say, conventional management business and economics frameworks, such as transaction cost economics, resource-based view, and institutional theory. And we were attempting to bring in an in international relations, international politics perspective in general, and more specifically, one very salient aspect of international relations, that is international conflicts, because international conflicts have a very profound and uh, deeply ingrained uh, impact on the collective memories of the populations involved. Um, to do so, we draw on intergroup relations uh, research which is a theoretical uh, research frame from um, social psychology that deals with the search of individuals for their social identity in intergroup settings. And this research is particularly relevant, we argue, for mergers and acquisitions, that is M&As, because M&As are inherently about uh, groups that are interacting and merging with each other. Now, there are two main uh, mechanisms uh, behind this theory. One is social categorization. The other one is social identity and social threat. Social categorization is about how do we view another group? Are they very different from us? Are they very similar to us? Uh, us versus them dynamics, whereas social identity and social threat is about um, kind of our perception of the other group in terms of are they more uh, collaborative, are they friendly, or are they antagonistic, uh, rivals to us, competitive, et cetera. Now, in the case of MAs, in the case of domestic MAs, oftentimes you can observe those social categorization and social identity dynamics, um, whereby target as well as acquiring firms may not want to, may not be willing uh, to work together to interact, leading to lesser performance over time. Uh, in the case of cross-board acquisitions, though, there is another layer of complexity that is being added. So besides the, or in addition to organizational identities, we're also talking about national identities. And our main argument, our main notion is that when there has been uh, plenty and severe military conflicts, that is when there has been an antagonistic relationship between two countries, uh, then perceptions of threat, conquest, loss of national identity, et cetera, will be much more profound in cross-border acquisitions involving firms from those two countries. Thus, um, the, the individuals involved in those cross-border acquisitions will be less willing to work together, uh, to interact with each other. There will be friction, negative friction, as well as conflicts, and anticipated performance will be much lower, uh, thereby leading to lesser or worse stock market uh, reaction to the announcement of those cross-border acquisitions. And that's our main hypothesis. That is bilateral military conflicts negatively influence market reaction to cross-border acquisitions. Now, if it is indeed the intergroup relation dynamics that matter here, then, social, then factors that affect social categorization as well as social identity should also influence that main relationship. And one of those factors of social categorization is cultural similarity or cultural differences. And our uh, argument, our proposition is that if two firms, even though they've had an uh, antagonistic relationship on a political level, are from the same cultural cluster, then individuals in those nations, in those countries share, share very similar values, very similar attitudes, behaviors, etc., whereby they will perceive the other firm, whether it's the acquirer or the target firm, as being rather similar, and social categorization dynamics will be mitigated. Um, this has us this had us argue that uh, the, the main relationship 
will be much weaker when firms from the same culture cluster that is that are very similar in culture are um, merging, so to speak. Now on the social identity front, social threat front, we are arguing that when there has been a colonizer colony relationship, and we're talking about a directional one, that is when the acquiring firm is from a home country that used to be the colonizer of the target firm's home country. So the target firm home country being a colony, then uh, there will be much more pronounced effects on, in terms of um, you know, national identity because it's almost as if we're talking about a revival of a former uh, leader and follower relationship. So the target firm's employees, managers, et cetera, will be much less willing to work together to uh, take orders from the acquiring firm from a former colonizer country. In a similar, uh, similarly, uh, we also argue that national pride of the target country matters here because the more prideful, quote unquote, uh, the target country is, the more, the less willing, the less willing they will be to be integrated to take orders from a foreign country, especially one from an antagonistic uh, relationship, political relationship. So national pride as well should increase, should, should strengthen the negative influence of bilateral military conflicts. Lastly, we argue, we propose that a target's firm size should matter as well in enhancing the effects of social identity and social threat. Why is that the case? Because target firm size uh, are a symbol for their economic significance on average. So the larger, the more valuable target firm is, the more important they are to, the, to their home country's economy. In the extreme case, a target firm that is very large and very uh, popular, for example, can be considered a national jewel. And if a national jewel is being acquired by a firm from another country, especially one, a country that has been antagonistic toward the focal country, the focal target country, then um, the social identity, social threat issue will be much more pronounced, will be much stronger, and the influence of bilateral uh, military conflicts will also be much more negative. We've been testing these hypotheses using uh, cross-border acquisitions data, in particular over 7,000 cross-border acquisitions data from almost 50 countries, and we find support for those relationships. Uh, what do we hope to achieve in terms of encouraging future research? Well, first of all, we've been kind of looking at um, firm level data and our arguments are based on the firm level and on the aggregate level. And that in our view does make sense to some extent because um, international conflicts, they affect the collective memories of the individuals involved. However, individuals' perceptions may vary quite a bit depending on an individual's uh, personality, characteristics, as well as their relationships, for example, their personal relationships as exchange students, as expats in countries that are quote unquote antagonistic, but they may have built relationships that mitigate those antagonistic political relationships. So we hope future research will perhaps uh, pay some additional attention to, to that issue. At the same time, um, post acquisition strategies may matter significantly and particularly integration strategies in our case, because our assumption would be, unfortunately we didn't have the data to test that, um, that strong or, or high integration levels will be particularly detrimental to uh, antagonistic political relationships involving those, those firms, because then uh, social identity threats will be much more pronounced. Um, therefore, it could be interesting to take a closer look at how integration decisions as well as other post acquisition strategies affect the influence of international politics as well as international relations. And lastly, um, future research could potentially look at asymmetries in international relations and conflicts. So in our case, we were primarily looking at a count as well, a weighted count variable. And I don't wanna get into the methods here, but um, it could be interesting to look at, well, who was the quote unquote antagonizer or aggressor in certain international conflicts. It won't be as easy because oftentimes uh, both countries feel the other one is the aggressor actually probably in the majority of cases, but there are definitely cases, for example, the second world war where it's pretty unanimous uh, who the quote unquote aggressors were, et cetera. So those could be issues that could be studied and brought into business and management research as well in the future. Uh, thank you very much uh, for, for, yeah, for listening and I'm looking forward to taking uh, your questions. Thank you, Chen Guan. You already see in the Q&A
uh, function in Zoom that we've got some questions that are in comments that are coming in the pipeline, and that's exactly what we're looking for. Jennifer's fielding those, putting them together for uh, presentation or in the, the follow on Q&A. Um, let me at this point shift things over to John Luis at, at Sussex University for a summation of his paper on that. John, the floor is yours. Unmute, let me share my screen. There we go. Okay, so hi everyone. So our paper comes at this from a slightly different angle, uh, more from a policy perspective. Uh, and then we explore the, the implications for, for IB. Uh, so just by way of introduction, you may ask the question, why is this important? Um, so why should we be interested in fragile and conflict affected states within IB? So the World Bank states that currently uh, around 2 billion people live in countries where the development outcomes are affected by fragility, conflict, and violence. And that by 2030, the share of the global poor living in fragile and conflict affected states is actually projected to reach 50%. Uh, so that's uh, um, you know, uh, a very substantial part of the world's population. Furthermore, conflicts uh, drive about 80% of all humanitarian needs. So the objective of this paper was to advance the understanding of the nexus between business environment reforms, uh, so BER, uh, and the sustainable development goals, uh, and in particular, focusing on SDG 16, which has a strong sort of conflict uh, focus, uh, mindful of the interconnections between uh, conflict, fragility, and underdevelopment. So we do this by examining the experience of four African countries, uh, namely Rwanda, Burundi, Uganda, and Ethiopia. Um, I'm not going to go into the methodology, but we ended up interviewing 83 respondents, including uh, country experts, investors, policy makers, and of course, civil society. So, as you know, the SDGs are structured around a partner-centered approach uh, with an explicit role for business involvement. And this provides an opportunity for the, the IB agenda. Uh, we've also seen uh, donor agencies and multilateral financial institutions increasingly promote BER as a component for future development strategies uh, of, of fragile states. So you may ask the question, what do I mean by BER? Um, well, generally speaking, BER is fundamentally about uh, reducing the transaction costs of doing business uh, and increasing policy certainty uh, so as to increase investment and competitiveness. And it is premised on several causal links about making markets work for, for the poor. Um, and the idea is that by harnessing the private sector through increased investment, uh, this in turn will lead to higher economic growth, uh, employment, and then presumably a reduction in conflict. Now, the conflict resolution literature has shifted away from this model uh, towards one which is much more embedded in complexity theory. Um, and this really aims to invest in the resilience of social institutions. So we really have two very different sort of approaches to BER, uh, one which is premised on a linear deterministic model and the other which is uh, rooted in complexity and systems thinking. And really what we do in this paper is to uh, examine these two approaches and see how they manifest uh, in these four case studies. So let me uh, just provide a quick overview of the four countries, uh, which differ substantially across a variety of dimensions. So by the numbers, uh, Ethiopia has the largest population of about 100 million uh, followed, uh, and then Sierra Leone is by far the smallest, around six and a half million. 
And likewise, in terms of the size of the economy, you're looking at you know, uh, a variation between 73 billion on the one hand and three and a half billion on the other. Um, it's also important to mention that all four countries demonstrate considerable differences and dualities between urban and rural areas. And this is going to be very important uh, when we get to the discussion. Uh, these differences, we think, make the substantial congruence of the findings all the more important because it does suggest that the dynamics of BER are rooted in socio-political factors that cut across quite different countries. Um, in terms of BER, Ethiopia and Rwanda have been the most effective uh, and instrumental in using the laws and formal state institutions as tools for BER. Um, whilst in Uganda and Sierra Leone, these really represent states where uh, the formal system seldom really captures how decisions are actually made or implemented. And then lastly, in terms of timelines, uh, Ethiopia and Rwanda started their current reform paths uh, back in the mid 1990s, and then Sierra Leone and Uganda's uh, started more recently in the early uh, 2000s. So the interviews demonstrated that whether one considered BER successful or not really depends upon what one regards as uh, its primary objectives. So if you measure success by a reduction in transaction costs, then interventions such as one-stop shops, which have become very um, uh, utilized, uh, have been quite effective in some countries, uh, most notably that of uh, Rwanda. And we think that this connects to the public administration literature on so-called pockets of effectiveness that can occur in countries that overall have relatively weak public administration systems and yet produce some well-functioning individual agencies, uh, although at a cost, and we'll come back to this, the cost in a moment. Um, the other thing is that concerns were expressed that BER may bestow certain advantages, and I think this is important for the IB community, on foreign investors or politically connected uh, individuals who get access to what one respondent called these oases of efficiency, but smaller domestic players are excluded from this and they have to then survive in the dysfunctional system. Um, and as I said, the cost of maintaining these, these pockets might in fact be uh, disproportionate. What also became very clear to us is the complexities of the political economy of BER, which have not always led to outcomes uh, that we think are compatible with inclusive development. So the very factors uh, that make a context fragile, and I'm thinking here of things such as, you know, rent seeking, uh, contested power and legitimacy between the center and the periphery in these dualistic economies, often undermine attempts to address fragility. And we've seen BR associated with the consolidation of power by a ruling er elite rather than broad-based uh, expansion. Uh, another factor that we think is important is that in countries in which up to 80% of the population engages in subsistence agriculture, uh, BER is to some extent, um, you, know, you can call it an elite activity whose benefits accrue disproportionately to large players in the formal economy. Um, and also that it, it actually often displaces local communities from land, which is set aside for foreign enterprises. Uh, and this is especially the case in land intensive sectors such as uh, mining or commercial agriculture. You know, and I think this presents particular challenges to international business which may intend to be part of the solution, but actually ends up crowding out uh, uh, indigenous enterprises. So what I'm presenting here is really uh, our framework. And what the four countries demonstrate 
is the various ways in which BER and related investment promotion efforts have in some cases actually exacerbated conflict and undermined the development goals. Um, and this is also consistent with increasing evidence of, uh, conf of growing confrontation amongst companies and communities uh, in fragile states um, whilst investment flows have been increasing. Uh, and this has been putting market reforms in tension uh, with the SDGs. So our argument is that BER has the potential to advance the achievement of SDGs, but to do so, it really needs to do three things. Uh, it needs to stimulate broad-based economic growth. It needs to expand economic op opportunities, not only in the formal sector, but in informal markets as well. And then lastly, it needs to address the deep underlying drivers of conflict and fragility. Um, and so it is possible for BER to be part of a broader development plan, but this does require a move away from a linear transactional approach towards a systems approach that recognizes a complex network of uh, interconnected uh, interests, agendas, and systems, which we reflect here. So what this shows is really a consensus-based approach which tries to balance competing interests. Um, and these competing interests uh, manifest in various ways. So the first one relates to the exercise of power um, between formal and traditional authorities um, and also between national and regional governments. The second relates to the prioritization of BER for human development. And here in particular, we want to emphasize the benefit that it needs to demonstrate benefits for subsistence farmers, the urban poor and women. And then lastly, relates to the impact on inequalities um, between those in the formal and informal economies, uh, between those in urban and rural populations, uh, between different regions. And this is particularly important where these are uh, politically or, or ethnically defined. So where markets reforms can account for these three dimensions, they may create positive feedback loops in the systems that promote development and reduce inequalities, um, but uh, this needs to be done uh, quite explicitly. Our last slide just looks at the implications for, for international business. Um, and we think that the implications for IB are, are very substantial for foreign businesses operating in uh, these fragile environments. We think that in order to contribute towards real development, that uh, they need to shift to a systems approach uh, which leverages these meaningful relationships that I've been talking about with stakeholders, uh, and that's deeply embedded in the local political economy. We also think that they need to recognize, and this is that MNEs are not only institution takers, but that they impact significantly on local institutions and that they may actually affect the underlying conflict dynamics. The very entry is going to affect these conflict dynamics and that this may require the development of new and atypical capabilities uh, to navigate uh, these dynamics. I know I'm out of time, so Final statements just to say that you know, our call to action for the IB community is that how we reconcile these tensions and bring them to the fore within the IB policy agenda, we think is going to be central uh, going forward. Um, I know I've run out of time, so I we can maybe talk about areas for future research as, as part of the questions. Thanks, John. Thanks for the, the summation and thanks for sticking to time on this. We have more time for questions. The Q&A is line is building up. We've got about 15 in the queue, but that means many more that Jennifer can uh, work through. So let me, without further ado, turn over to our third paper by Chang Liu from Rutgers. Chang, the floor is yours. Hello. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? All right. Uh, let me, so I'm sharing my slides. Is it showing properly on? Perfect. 
All right, uh, thank you. Uh, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to join the seminar and share our research with you. Uh, this paper is co-authored with Dan Lee at Indiana University. We examine an extreme type of, of conflict that, that international businesses are confronted with, which is terrorist attack uh, in host countries. And this type of conflict is weighing on, on managers' mind. The annual survey of global CEOs conducted by PricewaterhouseCoopers shows that in 2017, 20% of the survey CEOs said they are extremely concerned about terrorism in their global operations. And the percentage became 41% in, in 2018. So clearly terrorism is posing some significant challenges to, to international business and, and challenges that the managers are really concerning about. In this paper, what we're trying to do here is we examine how do multinationals respond to terrorist attacks in host countries where they are already operating in so that they couldn't avoid the risk ex ante. Uh, and more importantly, to decide on how to respond, m and need information to assess the situation. So where do they get the information they need and, and what influences their reliance on a particular information source? When we look at uh, current literature, firm level research that examines how individual MEs respond to host country terrorist attacks and how, how they make the related decisions uh, remains limited. The few existing studies, and, and, and most notably a few works by one of our moderators today, Jennifer and her colleagues, find that host country terrorist attacks deters uh, deters new entry and expansion and drive a, incumbent firms to divest in response. Uh, firms differ in terms of how likely they will divest in, uh, in, in response to, to terrorist attacks in, 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 in a host country. And that is influenced by, by their own experience of dealing with terrorist attacks in that particular host country. Uh, from a decision-making perspective, from a decision-making perspective, experience could be viewed as an internal information source. Uh, experience provides information that, that could help MNAs better assess the host country environment after terrorist attacks so that they can make more informed decisions as to whether they should leave or stay. But other than experience, we don't know other sources of information that MNAs could rely on to assess the impact of terrorism once terrorist incidents once they occur uh, and, and make response decisions accordingly. So we draw on uh, inter-firm imitation literature to argue that when, when MNAs are faced with terrorist attacks in a host country, peers' actions also serve as a critical information source. This is an external information source. And inter-firm mutation literature has long argued that under uncertainty, peers' actions reveal information about how they assess the situation and whether they view a, a specific action as sensible. But in this context, peers' actions probably do not provide enough information. Uh, because first, terrorist attacks creates uncertainty to both the focal firm and its peers. So peers' actions probably do not reflect the true impact of the terrorist semi incidents as peers themselves probably don't know what to do either. And second, uh, there are inherent ambiguity in observational learning. Peers divestment may not be a direct, a direct results of the current terrorist incidents. It might be just co-occurring with the, with the incidents. So, so peers actions might not be a useful information source. Then our question is, do the focal firms still rely on this information source or do they discard this information source completely? And if they do still observe and learn from others' actions, are there boundary conditions to their observational learning? Uh, what we propose in this paper is m &E's will still refer to peers' actions for information when deciding on how to respond to the uh, ongoing terrorist attacks in the host country. But since peers' current actions do not provide enough information, the focal firm will seek more information from peers' past actions in similar situations in the host country.
Now, if a focal firm observed that peers always divested when terrorist attacks happen in the host country, then the information is clear and unambiguous. It means terrorist attacks are very likely to have significant impact on the Manis, so they leave each time when, when, when terrorist incidents occur. But if peers sometimes left and sometimes stayed when faced with similar, very similar terrorist attacks in a, in a, in a, in a host country, it could become very difficult for the observing firm to draw unambiguous information from peers' actions about whether and how much impact terrorist incidents actually have on enemies. And we argue that this, this inferential difficulty due to the temporal inconsistency in peers' actions, peers' behavioral patterns, lead the focal firm to reduce their reliance on peers' actions for information simply because this, this information source becomes more difficult to, to make use of, so to speak. Uh, and the, the extent to which peers' behavioral pattern under terrorist attack is, is consistent over time, which we call uh, temporal consistency, is an important boundary condition to uh, Amini's reliance on peers' actions for information. Accordingly, our research questions are, how do peers' divestment influence the relationship between terrorist attacks in the host country and focal MNA's divestment from that country? And how does the temporal consistency in peers' behavioral patterns uh, under terrorist attacks influence the, 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 the moderating effects of peers' current actions? We, we focus on two groups of peers. Uh, same industry home country peers and geographically proximate home country peers. We find that when these two groups of peers divest in the face of terrorist attacks in the whole country, the focal firm will be more likely to divest as well. And when peers' behaviors under terrorist attacks show a temporally consistent divestment pattern, their current divestment will have a stronger effect on the focal firm's uh, likelihood of divestment. A few implications from this study. Theoretically, we contribute to international business research on how multinationals respond to uh, various types of violent conflicts in host countries and how they make the related decisions. We specifically highlight the effect of where MLEs get the information they need to make decisions and what specific information they retrieve uh, on their response decisions. I find that peers' observable actions are an information source in, in this context. We also extend uh, in, in from imitation literature by examining a novel boundary condition of imitation, which is the temporal consistency in reference groups' actions. Now, what's novel about this boundary condition is that it influences inter-firm imitation through influencing how difficult it is for the focal firm to observe and learn. Uh, even when reference firms are viewed as highly relevant and legitimate references, if their actions are simply very difficult to interpret and understand and draw useful information from, then uh, from an observing firm's perspective, this information source simply doesn't, uh, it simply isn't very helpful uh, for them to, to draw information and make decisions. Uh, our findings also have some policy implications to managers who find their firms facing host country terrorist incidents. We suggest that they need to be aware that they are especially likely to be influenced by peers' actions if peers have repeatedly adopted some action. Because temporal consistency does not necessarily mean that the actions peers repeatedly adopted is appropriate, is right. It might just be a group level inertia. Uh, and also, the inter-firm influence we find in this context demonstrate the social amplification of terrorism threat. Now, the social amplification effect, it does not mean that firms should actually take terrorist incidents lightly or more lightly than they currently do. Uh, what, what, what it does imply, though, is that the actual impact of terrorism incidents on FDI in a host country might be much greater than the direct impact of these incidents. And there is a ripple effect here, so to speak. Uh, 
uh, even, even if some firms are not directly impacted by the terrorism incidents, if they observe that peers have left it, it's possible that by, by imitating those peers' actions, they still divest. So, so the, the actual impact of terrorism incidents on FDI in the host country might be much larger than, than the direct impact of these incidents. Um, so uh, we, we argue that it's especially critical for the host country government to take prompt actions to respond to terrorist attacks and to help MNAs uh, reduce losses from, from, the, from the terrorist attacks and, and maybe recover faster so that they have greater confidence to stay and maintain normal operations in the host country. And in that way, they could collectively avoid the ripple effect uh, created by terrorist incidents. And for future research, for future research, we believe it's meaningful to investigate more of the, on, on how MNEs deal with various types of conflicts in their international operations uh, and how they make the related decisions. Also important is, I think it, it's, it's, it's meaningful, it will be meaningful to investigate how the managers and the decision makers themselves differentiate different types of violent conflict. Um, and it's, it's, it's also interesting to study various information sources through which MNEs acquire information and process the information to assess the threat of conflict and decide on how to respond in, in both the short run and in the long run. Uh, another interesting question along this line is, what if different information sources give different and possibly conflicting information? How do firms make decisions in the face of conflicting information from various sources in this context? Uh, and also when it comes to information processing, different firms and executives might view the same signal and information differently. So future research could explore the heterogeneity therein uh, and how executives' subjective interpretation uh, influence firm strategies and decisions when, when, when confronted with violent conflict. Uh, I think my time is up. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Thank you, John. I appreciate it. We have a healthy queue in the Q&A, and we have some chat uh, commentary as well for Jennifer to field. So I'm going to turn it over to Jennifer. And Jennifer, you're going to take it from there. The floor is yours. OK, thank you very much, Paul. Well, those are three great presentations, and we would certainly generated a great deal of interest and comments. So. I'm uh, attempting to synthesize some of them for each of the pres presenters. So I apologize to those of you who posted comments if I don't cover every single um, every single one, but I'd like to address Cheng Guan first and I'll go in order of the presentations. I guess there were two categories of uh, comments, I think for your paper. And one was on the power dynamics at play here. I think there was a lot of interest in how, th how your results um, might uh, explain differences between, let's say, Canada and the UK, or how the dynamics between Canada and the UK, for example, would differ between uh, Zimbabwe and the UK, where there's a, a great deal of power differential and how that uh, might play into your study. Also, there was, a, I guess, a multiple questions about uh, TCE, transaction cost economics, and whether and why it can explain some of the dynamics that you're talking about here. And um, then there was also um, some questions related again to power dynamics about, uh, let's see, if, you know, if Chinese and Korean CEOs take pride in acquiring firms from historically powerful countries like the UK, US, and Germany, you know, um, how might this differ again from the previous example where you have Canada and Zimbabwe and again, so it's m mostly the relative uh, power dynamics between the various players and then also why you think TCE may be limited in the, in, uh, to some extent. All right, got it, Jennifer. Uh, I much appreciate your summary of the questions. Um, I think those are very, I mean, very good and very valid questions. Uh, in particular, I mean, I think there was one comment by Nigel Driffield uh, looking at the more nuanced aspects of colonizer colony relationship. And I would, so we didn't uh, test it and we didn't have the data to test it, but I would say it's definitely a valid point. Um, Perhaps, and that's just an assumption, the more exploitative uh, colonizer colony relationship used to be, the more or the stronger the impact probably uh, probably will be on the influence of uh, bilateral military conflicts, whereas a uh, quote unquote more peaceful relationship or uh, you know, a less exploitative relationship probably will have a different, different influence. As far as reverse power dynamics go, um, we did test that as well. I would say as as far as a colony 
firm, a firm whose home country used to be a colony of an uh, acquired firm, a target firm, whose home country used to be a colonizer. There are definitely pride issues involved. I think there was a paper by Hope at Ali 2011. Um, how it affects bilateral military conflicts? I need to think about it. I, so I, I, I don't know, I need to think about it. It would be an interesting thing to explore. Um, we did run the data uh, just to see. Uh, it didn't have a relationship, a significant relationship, a moderating relationship, but it would be an interesting dynamic to explore for sure. Um, yeah, the TCE question, I'm, was that one? We'll hold that, yeah, we'll hold that for John perhaps. Uh, okay, great. And well, what we'll do is I'll post some questions to each of the presenters and then we can loop around again as well as uh, to, to give everybody some time to respond and to engage each presenter. Uh, let's see, uh, John, a few questions for you. I think one question was, to some extent is the difference between what you're proposing with the BER, how does that compare to the Washington consensus? And is it a matter of implementation in the sense that maybe the Washington consensus proponents would suggest that that would be a very effective um, approach, would accomplish many of the same things that you're suggesting? And so how does it uh, differ in terms of implementation? Uh, and then let's see, and then I guess how, you know, one of the implementation issues is also making sure how do you address all these different actors and make sure that these uh, traditionally less powerful groups are represented because that's been an ongoing problem or you know a difficulty in economic development work more broadly and then also um, yes yeah, so I'll direct uh, really the TCE question to you is why do you think TC is not a, a, a good approach for addressing some of these issues and uh, if you could elaborate on that that would be great yeah. Uh, so uh, thanks very much. Uh, so uh, a, a couple of things. So firstly, I mean, the traditional approach to, to BER, I think, is actually very aligned with uh, the Washington consensus. So it comes from sort of a similar sort of, of paradigm, quite a linear sort of approach, uh, very much focused on, so very much a type of transaction cost uh, approach uh, and very much directed towards uh, generating uh, so so you know if you, in terms of what is being captured is really primarily uh, from a competitiveness efficiency economic output uh, type of approach. Really, what we're suggesting in in this paper and so so that's sort of the traditional Washington consensus. Ber is really sort of I think what increasingly donor agencies and multilateral financial institutions are increasingly dressing this up in a different guys, but fundamentally, I think it does have a lot of um, overlaps with the traditional Washington consensus. And so I think a lot of the, the, um, the, the, uh, the, the, criti the criticisms of the Washington consensus apply here as well. What makes us worse in the context is uh, that we're looking at is because you have the additional dimensions of, of that these are uh, countries coming out of uh, environments of high uh, uh, conflict and fragility. So this sort of increases uh, the, uh, the 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 you know the potential trade-offs that uh, that 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 manifest. So really, what we're suggesting is a much more systems-based approach, an approach which recognizes uh, that we cannot simply focus on uh, unidimensional outcomes such as economic growth. Uh, because by doing that, what may in fact happen is that it may exacerbate the underlying causes of, of, uh, of conflict, uh, that it may exacerbate uh, inequality and the dualities that are really present uh, in, uh, in these particular countries. Um, so in terms of, you know, the, the, uh, I think I've sort of addressed the TCE question. I mean, really just to say that I think what, what BER is good at is actually it is relatively good as a disciplining device. So uh, in terms of macroeconomic stability uh, and so forth. And so it is good at that. If, you, if, you, if what you're trying to capture is a reduction in transaction costs, then it is relatively effective in that. Really what we're just suggesting is that's only one dimension of what should be looked at and that there may be these trade-offs. <laughs> Sorry, Jennifer, I can see you moving, but I can't hear you. 
Yes, hello. You know, when we talk about conflict and other issues, you wouldn't believe it, but there's a fire alarm going off in my building as I speak. Oh, wow. <laughs> so that's a distraction. So I, I feel safe in, in uh, carrying on and going to uh, Chang's uh, presentation, but I thank you very much. Uh, all the grits that you study the conflict, but then now you have implementations. So, um, Let's see, I guess I'd like to move to the, the next question. And I think one of the issues, uh, Cheng, for your study is there's a lot of curiosity about how much um, is this debate between the mimetic pressures that companies may have or the mimetic tendencies where they copy what other firms do uh, versus developing their own internal capabilities. So that's one of the, I guess, key issues that uh, people have raised. And then also how does it differ based on the source of terrorism and um, you know, the dynamics within a country, what's caused that. If you could address that, that would be great. Uh, so thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, so um, I'm going to start with the first one. Uh, I, I think that question, that's a great question that points to the interaction of, of uh, internal, uh, internal information sources, internal knowledge sources, and external information sources. Uh, in the context of, of MNAs making decisions about how to respond to terrorism. Uh, uh, although that's, that's beyond the scope of, of our study because we, we focused explicitly on external information sources, uh, we did control for internal uh, capability and experience. So above and beyond the effects of internal knowledge and internal information, uh, we find uh, the effect, the influence of external information. Uh, and speaking of the, the effect of internal capability, internal information, internal knowledge source, whatever it is called, uh, in, in previous literature, um, one, one, one work by, by Jennifer, by you, right? One of your previous work shows that uh, when, when firms have greater internal capability, they are uh, they are indeed more capable of, of uh, navigating through these uh, adversities in the host country so that they have uh, greater survivability and they can stay there. Uh, that's, that's, that's the first question. And the second question is uh, uh, various types of attacks, am I, am I correct? Yeah, so if you could talk a little bit more about the dynamics within the country uh, uh, in terms of the terrorist attacks and how that might play and how companies respond. Uh, more dynamics in terms of in, that, in terms of the mimetic versus developing capabilities. How does that affect, let's say, the the government, the role of the government in the country affected by terrorist attacks versus, um, uh, you know, does that have any role to play, or have you looked at that at all in any of your research? The the role of host country government. Yes, in managing the terrorist uh. attack. Yeah, sure. Uh, so uh, again, we, we also control for that uh, uh, because because I, I d definitely think that the role of government is important in this context. Is on the on the one hand, it it, it, it gives the, the companies confidence about how likely the situation is going to go back to norm normal uh, quickly, and how likely future uh, occurrence of, of this type of incident. Uh, how, how likely future occurrences. Um, so we, we can drill for that. And I think uh, a general conclusion from previous study is that when, when a country, host country government is believed to be more capable, uh, the uh, firms will be less likely to leave in general, at the collective level, they're, they're less likely to leave in general when, when this type of exogenous shocks happen. So that's the, that's the role of, of uh, host country government and how we accounted for that. Um, maybe I can go a little bit back in reverse order as well. And uh, let's see, uh, if we could talk a little bit about, uh, going back to one of the questions here. Um, you know, well, first of all, I guess I open it up to maybe uh, several of you, these overlap the different presentations, but the role that culture may play in some of these conflicts. So obviously Cheng Wan addressed, you know, these there's these different power dynamics and how culture may affect how countries respond. Um, and then let's see, there's also to some extent, John, what it, how that might play into some of the work that you're doing. Um, and maybe if uh, I can pose that out there and see if any of you have looked at the role of culture and how you might respond. There've been several questions about that related to the presentation. 
Is anyone going to take it? So I mean, just uh, just to say from my side, I mean, we Thanks. we didn't ex we didn't explicitly look at uh, at, at at culture, so uh, it, it probably uh, would be better sort of uh, answered by somebody else. All right, so, so we did explicitly look at, well, let me first say, Jennifer, thank you so much for your dedication. I hope you're safe, really. I think we all hope you're safe, so uh, yeah. we're <laughs> all glad to be part of this, part of this legendary webinar, I, I suppose. Yes, I guess so, right. So, so we explicitly looked at culture and we looked at cultural uh, similarities or differences from a you know, shared cultural cluster perspective. But I mean, the questions are very interesting in terms of, well, how do certain cultural dimensions may affect uh, you know, perceptions toward former antagonistic uh, relationships, at least in the case of our paper, or maybe you know, terrorist attacks and so on and so forth uh, in, in Chang's paper, et cetera. So uh, we didn't look at that explicitly. Uh, but it could be an interesting, you know, follow-up question to pursue. That's true, yeah. Uh, we didn't look at okay, culture uh, explicitly either, but I, I think uh, just from an information processing perspective, I certainly think culture and culture distance and all, all those aspects could have an impact on, on, on uh, for instance, how and where uh, an MNA could get information that, that help them to assess the, the situation with, with conflicts in the host country and how easy it is for them to process those information, so on and so forth. Jennifer, if I can right. jump in, I, I want to make sure that we're all aware that, remember, our special issue is one more uh, question has yeah. uh, that, let's see, how would you, I, you may not have looked at these specific examples, but how would you say that um, the terrorist attacks, let's say, in Turkey in 2003, have you looked at any particular situations where you can track what companies have been doing in response? Do you need responded to that particular case? Uh, so what we did, I, uh, I did in, interview with a couple of managers, but uh, our focus is primarily on, on uh, diving into the details of where they get the information, and how they perceive the information, how they, they process the information. Uh, but there were a few instances uh, where the, the managers talk specifically about some uh, quite salient terrorist incidents that, that, that they personally experienced as they were expats in a, in a, in a host country. Uh, not the Turkey one, but uh, they talked about a few others. Uh, yeah, that's 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 what that's that's what we did. But any any anything else in that question? Did did I did I did I understand the question correctly? Basically, just these examples of companies in practice. Companies practice in terms of. Yeah. Um, I apologize, everybody. This is a very rare circumstance, but I have to evacuate the building. <laughs> um, perhaps I can pass it over to Paul for a moment. Thank you. I got it. So first off, Jennifer, go be safe. Secondly, um, I, for everyone here, this is an example of the special issue, which is all about uncertainty and ambiguity, yes. and in this case, personal danger. So let's make sure Jennifer is safe on this. Let me uh, pose, uh, pick up and, at where Jennifer left off. Let me pose a question to each one of you, and it's around a little bit of the just the, the research approach to this. Uh, and let me do it in, in, from first to third on this. And one, I'm, I'm really interested in, from the standpoint of uh, developing this research and maybe the follow-on research, how you thought and your co-authors thought about the, the inherent trade-off between doing cross-sectional work where you can look at M&A transactions in great detail, but, but it, it's hard to look at the dynamics that is it, over time, right? Because you're watching it as a transaction at that moment or in a specific period versus a panel approach where you'd look at a, 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 a series of transactions that occur and you'd be able to parse out maybe the, the fixed as well as the dynamics, but you're giving away some detail. That's for you. I'd be curious how, how you think about that trade-off and research with the context you have in mind. Um, you know, for John, what I really am interested in is when you do this qualitative work, I'm so interested in the heterogeneity of responses and where you find unexpected differences in responses. So I'm really curious about how, for example, the, the way you pose questions to the different stakeholders in the multinational community and the government community, local business community, and, and the differences and the unexpected differences in it. I think that's one of the real advantages of, 
your methodological approach. And, and, and I'm curious about what you saw that was surprising that way. And then for Chang, what I have in mind is an interest in, in, in the way we think about the fundamental constructs. And, and this is one where I think it's just, it's an inevitable, again, it, it, you start an argument no matter what. When you talk about terrorism, one man's terrorism is another man's patriotism. And, and, and I think it's not just an issue about uh, you know, construct uh, development or measurement definition. We can all fight about that. It just, it's thinking about the scope of the research. And I'm curious about what you've learned in, in the scope of this research and where it takes you next with this foundational concept of terrorism. So let me, let me start with Cheng Guan and move down to Chang. Ruth, John. All right. All right. Uh, thanks, Paul. Uh, you know, it's a very, very important question, especially at the beginning in designing our study. So after we've kind of put in the pillars of the core concepts, of the core notions, uh, indeed, we were thinking about this major trade-off, really. I mean, either we were looking at the large uh, data set that is, in a way, cross-sectional in nature. So we were uh, applying event study methodology, looking at, you know, event window stock market reactions. Uh, before and after an announcement, or perhaps looking at uh, a much smaller sample, but then following an acquisition over a longer period of time, using maybe even survey measures and so on and so forth. And in the end, it's, well, it's probably not the most scientific thing, but it was more of a gut decision almost in terms of looking what is more feasible at that time, what could be, uh, what could help us derive more interesting, you know, uh, insights really. So, but it's at the very beginning, it was uh, probably one of the largest decisions to make, you're right. So. Mm -hmm. How about your, in your research, John? Yeah, so, um, so interesting. Um, the, so in terms of unexpected differences, uh, the interesting thing was uh, perhaps more in terms of the differences between countries. And then I'll sort of uh, talk about this in, uh, within countries. So. What, what surprised me, well, firstly, let me talk about the differences. So in Sierra Leone, uh, Uganda, and Ethiopia, there were very clear differences in terms of whether or not you are in a position of power, um, be it as a, uh, as a multinational, as a leading business person, or uh, from, a, uh, from an investor or donor perspective. Uh, there was that, you know, they had a very particular perspective, very pro uh, BR and that it's you know it, that it's 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 achieving sort of what it's meant to be achieving. Whereas when you were interviewing people in civil society and so forth, you got a very very different sort of response. Uh, and then it was really talking about how it is reinforcing um, unequal power relations and 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 so forth. What was what was fascinating was actually the case of Rwanda, where the responses were remarkably consistent. And I think one of the reasons for that is Rwanda has probably been the most systematic. The government, uh, BER, has been deeply embedded in the government's post uh, conflict narrative. And so that really has, uh, that filters through remarkably consistently. It's almost, no matter how far you probe, you're almost getting sort of the, the, a, a fairly consistent party line. And you really have to go, uh, you have to go quite uh, far to, and, and push quite hard to get people to um, uh, you know, to, 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 to say something to the contrary. Uh, and that I thought was, so it was actually the, the remarkable consistency in Rwanda, which, which was the inconsistency. They've got the script down well. Yeah. John, how about in your end? Uh, uh, this notion of how we think about terrorism, help us to understand it in the context of your struggle with this research and, and where you go next with that, uh, to deal with the inevitable uh, challenges, conundrums. Yeah, I think actually your question, you already pointed to a very interesting future direction uh, and uh, one that I'm, I'm personally pursuing right now. It's, uh, there are very uh, heterogeneous view in, a, in the mind of, of uh, managers and then the, the human being decision makers as to whether one condition constitutes a risk or threat or not. Uh, and. Uh, so, so once I interviewed with two executives who, who are from the, the, the exact same home country and both have projects in, in the same foreign country, and in fact, their projects are, are located very close to each other. And they talk about one terrorist incidents near their, uh, their project location uh, in that country in, 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 in one year, in 2010, I believe. And they have quite different perspectives. 
one executive said they view the incident as an isolated uh, event. It's a random event. It's not likely to happen in the future again. Uh, and another just view that as a systematic risk. Uh, obviously, that's going to lead them to make very different decisions as to whether they should respond to this risk at all and, and how exactly they're going to respond. So I think along that line, one very interesting future research is to recognize that the actual decisions are made by the human base. And the human base make those decisions based off of their subjective interpretation of the, of the situation. Uh, and also, just like uh, I mentioned just now, we, what, what, what we find in this research, practically speaking, it shows a social amplification of the, of the terrorism threat. Now, does that social amplification of terrorism threat mean that the firms have collectively exaggerated the threat? I don't think that necessarily is the case. What matters more is, uh, irrespective of whether that, that threat is a real risk or not, what matters is more of how, how the managers actually interpret that. Uh, and that interpretation could be influenced by social construction, could be influenced by, by the individual executives themselves, how they view the world, how they view things, so on and so forth. So I think, uh, yeah, in general, one interesting future direction is to focus more on the individual executives and how they make decisions and what attributes, what factors uh, on the part of the, the human decision makers influence their interpretation of the threat and how that subsequently influenced firm's decisions and, and operations. And it's also interesting, I think, uh, to, to look at, um, uh, as we have entered a, peri a, a, a period of, of constant exogenous shocks, I think it's, it's very interesting to look at whether the repeated occurrence of various types of exogenous shocks alter uh, individual ex executives interpretation of the, the same type of risk or similar types of risks so on and so forth. Uh, yeah, that's uh, my thoughts and, and where, where I think future research could, could head, to, head, head towards and where I am personally heading towards mm -hmm. right now. Hey, so let me, let me just, if I can, we, we've got about five, 10 minutes or so for, and I, and I want to be conscious of the time of everyone. And Tim, I, I put it to you to tell me when it's time for us to move to the wrap up around 80 minutes or so. So we're, we're heading about 10 minutes towards that. But if I don't mind, I'd like to work my way back from Chang to John to Cheng Wan with an individual question to each of you that maybe it is getting a little more into the weeds and the detail, but I, I think it feeds into the comments, the broader research design comments you have. So let me start with you, Chang. You just catch your breath just a moment. And, um, and what I want to get at is this, an alternative interpretation of the way CEOs who lead firms, we have this, how they respond to this. And I really like that you said, we're, that you thought about what CEOs and top managers are, are expressing. It's a kind of a, you know, the top management team approach uh, that we, we apply not just in IB, but in a lot of areas. Let me give you an alternative view and then tell me about how, how, how you try to deal with that and, and where you see this alternative view, which is a hurting view. So think of the, in the research and finance, we talk about who hurts and, and the way firms, especially analysts looking at firms, they, their, their assessments of risk really follow substantially from what the other guys do. And it's not so much about information, it's just a kind of a, it's a risk aversion. Nobody ever gets fired for making the same decision as the rest of the group if they're all wrong. They, and they do well if they do something differently and they're guessed right, and then they get fired if they go against the, so in this case, here's an alternative view on this. I divest because what I see when I can see it well enough is everyone else is doing it and I don't wanna lose my job. So the safe thing to do is to do what the crowd's doing if I can construe it. That's a, to me, it's, it's, a, it's a compelling alternative to, to kind of knock down. Tell me about thinking and how you knock that down in your work and where that fits in, in the research going forward, if at all. Uh, so I, I think that's a great question. I, I think the, so I've thought about that question. I, I think it has to do with how we define a, a sensible decision uh, in, in, a, in a particular context. So for example, there is a value in just following whatever others are doing. They might be wrong, but, but it's, it's worse if, if, if you just violate the group norm and you get some worse outcomes out of that. Um, and uh, I think uh, ties back to, to what I mean by what a sensible decision means. So it might be that a particular response is is just objectively superior because it generates better firm level outcomes. It might just be that uh, it's a safer choice. I think all of these fit into the idea of sensible decision. So when I theorize uh, in, 
extracting information from observing peers' actions and to, to decide whether a particular action is sensible or not in a specific situation. Uh, that part also is already incorporated into in, 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 my, in, my, in my theorizing, mm -hmm. if, 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 that, if that makes sense. It makes uh, perfect sense. It makes yeah, perfect so, enough, right? This work. Hey, let me turn to John, if you don't mind in this. It, it, I think one of the things that comes away from the follow-on to this heterogeneity question is, is about how the, the multinationals responded. You know, that's, that's our, our first stakeholder. It's not the only one in our research. And, and, and what it makes me think about is um, this first this notion of, of what's the obligation of the multinational to contribute, right? We're, what, what's our job? And you might say jobs to do a lot of different things for the firm. Now I'll sound like a, tr a typical trans, you know, transaction cost principal agent type and say, our job is to make sure they make a lot of money for my shareholders, okay, on this. And so I'm really curious about how indeed that, that heterogeneity and response, John, might be tied to the notion of the multinational trying to uh, accommodate what these SDGs are but understanding that that's the job of government, that when we respond to the, the, this, these, these reforms and think about these reforms, we're also very conscious of the fact that there are things we're supposed to do, even if we've got more resources in government sometimes, and you do maybe in Burundi, but the things we're not supposed to do, that government's supposed to be doing, that we should be finding ways you know, to not essentially fob it off to the multinational without sounding too much like a, 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 a board of director on the Cato Institute, <laughs> Tell us about how that fits into your research, if at all, John. Yeah. So um, I think the, 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 the important thing is, so one of the things that's very clear is when you are talking to multinationals operating in these environments is that they see themselves very much as institution takers. So they see themselves very often as victims of corruption, victims of the fact that things don't work, that the government doesn't do what it should do, and therefore, and you know, that they aren't responsible for uh, for, for that. Uh, you know, I'll really what uh, in these sort of environments uh, we really caution against that, uh, and it's not, it's not, uh, and 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 it makes sense for all sorts of different reasons. One is that I think there is increasingly uh, pressure from. Uh, in terms of ESG reporting, uh, I think that's, there's going to be increasing pressure from that side, uh, increasing pressure from uh, public uh, interest groups, activists, in terms of social impact investing. I also think it just makes good business sense. If you're operating in an environment where your business is contributing to conflict, your business is not sustainable. I don't mean sustainable in, you know, in, 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 in that way. It's just not sustainable. Uh, so... Uh, you know, you have to find a way of embedding yourself deeply in the political economy that you are part of the solution. Because also, if you align yourself too heavily with uh, with existing vested interests, uh, if they fall in these environments, you actually may find yourself on the wrong side of this of this particular divide. So our argument actually is that this is good business practice. Mm -hmm. I appreciate it. Cheng Guan, I'm going to cut you off because I know we want to stick to schedule. I know Tim and, and we want to do this. Let me, I'll pose it to you offline. Let me first say to all the, the, the paper presenters, thank you so much. It's just great to hear about the research. We've read it, but to see also where you're going. And, and, and I want to say how, to me, it's really developed well in terms of pointing us to the different topics that we can talk about in the context of political and social tension, but in a broader sense, what it means also for the theme of the special issue. And that, let me end where I began, which is be looking to contribute to the special issue in JIP. One, it's I think an exciting way to get your research out and into our research communities, but it too, it's all about also being relevant to debates. This is a real opportunity for us early on with this journal to weigh in in debates that go beyond the, just the four corners of IB research and also say things to our sister areas in the broader management, public policy field, and indeed to public policy professionals. It's really been a pleasure for me. Thank you for this opportunity to uh, step in and we wish Jennifer the best. Tim, let me give it back up to you for some parting words. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, it's, we're, as I told Jennifer, she is now kind of immortalized in AIB uh, webinar lore uh, as the first person who has been driven out of her home in a webinar. Uh, you know, and the, it, it's, uh, it's, it's always unique. Uh, again, I like to just emphasize, uh, you know, the, the, the importance of, of, of these types of webinars. I, you know, you know that the webinars are available um, on YouTube as well. Um, 
I think we've got about 1500 views after the fact of the, the prior webinars. So you can use the materials that are there um, uh, as you wish. Um, it's kind of all open comments. Um, I'd also like at this point also to thank, uh, you know, Tunga for all the great work he always does um, and, uh, and Renfei for organizing all the technical aspects of what it is we're doing. Uh, Paul, Jennifer, uh, for moderating, uh, Klaus, my co-organizer, uh, and, uh, and three speakers, uh, Chen Guan, uh, John, and, uh, and Chang. Um, what I'd like to do at this point is just kind of note, um, we have another webinar next week. Uh, this one's a little different in the sense that it's not related to any specific papers or any specific pieces of research. Uh, but we thought that it was, it, it was worthwhile to kind of do a bit of a a memoriam, uh, you know, kind of a little kind of mini festschrift uh, via webinar um, uh, relating to Oliver Williamson's influence. Um, and uh, the uh, the moderator is going to be Peter Klein um, with four speakers, uh, John Francois Henner, Joanne Oxley, David Teese, and Elaine Verbecki, uh, uh, talking about uh, the impact that Williamson had uh, not so much in terms of his own work, because he didn't publish a lot in international business. But as we saw today, you know, he's kind of looming in the background, you know, in terms of the nature of his influence on, on a lot of work. Uh, so I encourage you to join join us uh, next week. Uh, same AIB time, same AIB channel, as they would say. Uh, and I would again like to thank everybody and uh, wish everyone a good day. So thank you very much. And I will bring everything to a close.